called minimum description length principle. The idea behind it is very simple, right? Among equally, we are, we already looked at it in some form or the other. Okay, so, so lasso is one way of thinking of it as minimum description, right? Among all equally good classifiers, I would like to pick the one that requires the least amount of bits to describe it. Right, so, the description length should be as small as possible given that it has some acceptable levels of performance. Right. So, if you think about it, so what does this tell us? Well, if the classifier is very complex, then I am going to need a lot of bits to describe it. Right, if a neural network with a lot of weights, or a support vector machine with a lot of support vectors. Right, or a decision tree with a lot of branches. So, the more information you have, the more uh, uh, detailed the classifier is, the more number of bits I will need to describe it. Right? But then the better that it gets in performance, right? ideally. And why would you want to make it more complex? Only because it is making fewer errors. Right? Then you have to come up with some way of trading off this, the description of the classifier versus the error it makes. Right? You have, to, you have to specify what the classifier is. Right? I mean, you have to decide on how you want to specify it. Suppose it is number of support vectors, right. So, I will have to tell you what are the individual support vectors. You remember support vectors are alpha times uh, the xi's, right, xi, yi, right. So, I need to tell you what the xi's are, I need to tell you what the alphas are for me to specify a SVM completely to you, right. So, how many bits do I need for specifying those alphas and the xi's? So, the xi, yi I can take it as a product I, mean, I do not have to describe the yi separately, but I need something to describe that and maybe to describe the alpha also right? or maybe I can describe alpha xi to you if you can use that somehow to produce the inner product. Right? But if I have it the kernel version of it then I cannot do that. Right? So, I, so I, can't, I cannot pre multiply the alpha into that. Right? If it is a linear uh, thing I can do this I can give you the alpha xi. So, there are things to think about. Right? So, how do you encode this? Right. So, you want to write a program to implement the SVM at the end of the day, right. What is the point in me doing a learning algorithm and then not letting you use it, right. So, for me to communicate to you how you implement it, I need to give you the description, right. And uh, the second part is the errors are there, right. So, I make some mistakes, right. And I have to tell you on a training set, let us say there is a fixed training set and on that training set, I also want to tell you what are the errors I made. The smaller the amount of errors I make, the lesser the number of bits I need to tell you how many errors I made. Make sense? So, for me to make small errors, I might need a complex classifier that will need more bits for me to describe the classifier, right. So, if I want to reduce the number of bits I want to, to describe the error, I might increase the number of bits I want for describing the classifier and vice versa. I am sorry? Just to set up a trade off on equal footing, right. I am just talking about information on both sides now, right. So, there is I, I can make a classifier arbitrarily complex, right, and it will keep giving me better and better error, right. Or I can make a classifier very simple, then it can give me a lot of error. So, how do I do the trade off between the, the size of the classifier and the amount of error I make? So, to put these things on an equal footing so that we can compare. Right, people talk about the amount of information required in both cases. Right, you, have, you need some amount of information here and some amount of information here. So, the more information you need here, the lesser you need here. So, that is the trade off. Right, so, that is the idea behind minimum description length right? and uh, there is a huge theory behind it. Right, It is actually a proper uh, Bayesian approach. Right, We talked about uh, Bayesian learning at some point, we also talked about ML and map estimates and so on and so forth. You can show that MDL is actually a proper Bayesian approach and people have uh, derived a lot of uh, complexity measures, uh, performance measures based on MDL, right. So, I never talked about it earlier, right? uh, but I think you guys are all ready to now read up on your own about MDL, right. So, the, the brief introduction I gave should be sufficient, right. So, if you think just one minute and stop and think about how people actually use machine learning, right. It is very heavily empirical. Right. I mean, I, we have been doing a lot of math and other things or pseudo math in the class so far, right. Uh, uh, but um, 
really at the end of the day when you start using it right it becomes heavily empirical right it is actually a very applied uh, applied subject believe it or not I mean of course you guys are all finding it out now with, uh, with all the programming assignments uh, but it is actually a very very applied thing and uh, so whenever we have this kinds of empirical work right so you, you have to do you have to do experiments right you really have to do experiments there is nothing like uh, um, you know an, 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 an analytical solution to your machine learning problem right so when they give you a data set right you really have to experiment with the data to figure out what is it that you are going to do so all the theory and everything that we study now is all fine but when you actually get down to doing something you have to run experiments you have to do all kinds of things so you have to do experiments you also have to do some kind of some kind of exploratory analysis so in fact we have not really talked about uh, exploratory analysis at all in this uh, in this course right you have to do a lot of uh, different things so i actually do that whenever i teach my flavor of uh, data mining i do that so what do you do with exploratory analysis right <coughs> so there are many things that you have to do first you have to figure out uh, <coughs> so how distributed your variables are you know so you have to figure out so what is the range of the variables so i give you data right i don't you don't really know what the data is all about i just give you an uh, the simple form is i give you an excel file right the complex form is i give you like few terabytes of data on a disk right uh, but then uh, let's say i give you a file and then you have to figure out what are the different uh, variables that are there right right and what kind of uh, values do they take right and what is the variance of these values right or there are outliers on these is there, is there some values that i can ignore right so the whole bunch of things that you have to go and uh, do some kind of exploration right or there are va variables that are important to my prediction right so we we, we know about that we talked about some variable feature selection and things like that but all of this you have to do essentially you have to understand the data before you even think of what is the machine learning algorithm i'm going to use so if i give you some data you don't just straight away plug it into a decision tree a uh, uh, algorithm or straight away plug it into an svm right so you have to go around try to understand what the data is all about right uh, so that is part of it is through exploratory analysis <coughs> and say a little bit more l l later but as far as experiments are concerned <coughs> typically they fall under typically they fall under two kinds of uh, experiments so there is uh, there are manipulation experiments and observation experiments um so what do you think this mean right so in observation experiment i basically try to figure out correlations i try to figure out associations between variables right i make a lot of observations and then i try to see okay if this variable whenever this variable was at this level then the output was at that level right so maybe i can observe the weather so is essentially trying to find associations between right associations between factors and effects so what do i do in manipulation experiments in manipulation experiments is essentially these are things where i have some control over some of the variables that constitute the experiment right so typically i set up these kinds of manipulation experiments whenever i want to test a, a theory a causal hypothesis right i whenever i want to say that a causes b right so i cannot stop el nino from happening right so with those kinds of that doesn't make any sense but i can say something like okay um so my learning algorithm a is better than my learning algorithm b right whenever the load on my system is high 
so I can I can I can actually make a hypothesis like this right A is better than B whenever the load on the system is high. No, no, I have made my models. I have, I have model A, I have model B. Now, I want to make a make a statement that saying that A is better than B. Forget about under heavy load. I want to make a statement that okay, you have a learning algorithm A, he has a learning algorithm B. I want to make a statement that learning algorithm A is better than learning algorithm B. So, when will I make such a statement? When can I make such a statement? Uh -huh. Right. So, that is the whole thing that we are going to worry about. Here, I am going to test what I mean, uh, what I call 